Hello, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Yoko Nishimura, project manager for the Discover Nikkei at the Japanese American National Museum. We are very excited about today's program, What Does It Mean to be Nikkei in 2021? Today's program is presented by JANAM's Discover Nikkei project in partnership with Department of Asian and Asian American Studies of Loyola Marymount University. First, I wanted to acknowledge everybody who is essential on today's program in the slide that's, uh, maybe the Joey can also show the slide a minute. And today's, today's a presenter, Dr. Curtis Takada Lux and Dr. Lindsay Sasaki Kogasaka, who helped us plan this program from the beginning. And also facilitator, we have so many facilitators today, and also simultaneous interpreter from, you know, as in Spanish and Portuguese, and also language support team during this program. I would like to express huge thanks to all because this program wouldn't happen without their contribution. Also, many of them also know the Vicky Murakami to their another face of Discover Nikkei. She is here today. Usually we don't have many opportunity to meet with our contributors. So we are really excited that I hope we can talk to many of you after this program. So this is our first virtual program in three languages, English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Based on the RSVP list, people are joining from 21 countries today, 21, and not only major countries where Nikkei lives like Brazil, Peru, US, Canada, and Japan, but also countries which do not have many Nikkei population like Cuba and UK, Venezuela, Philippines and Germany and also Australia. So I'm very excited to know that the, today's program has become a truly a global Nikkei gathering. So I'm very looking forward to hearing diverse experiences and exchange ideas with you today. Um, but before we start the main program, I know everybody wanted to hear the, you know, the findings, but I would like to quickly introduce the Discover Nikkei project. So Discover Nikkei is a journal of the international and a community-based web project with major funding from the Nippon Foundation. It was launched in 2005. Our mission is to connect generation and the communities by sharing the story and the perspectives of Nikkei around the world. The site was created in four languages, English, Japanese, Spanish, and Portuguese. So currently there are about 40,000 monthly unique visitors. We share unique Nikkei story from around the world with very diverse and unique topics. The central theme of our site is Nikkei cultural identity. And some articles are uh, very historical while some are more contemporary and some are very academic, but we are also share a weekly comics and also fictional story as well. So those are accessible uh, via journal articles and the video interview and the photo and the video based tool called the Nikkei album. So I want you to know that those story are mainly contributed by our site users. So today I saw some, you know, the Discover Nikkei contributor to this program as well. So if you want to share some Nikkei related story and our site might be for you. So please contact us anytime. And because of this global nature of Discover Nikkei, we collaborated with the Nippon Foundation's Global Nikkei Young Adult Research Project, which started in December 2018. This project examined how Nikkei young adults around the world feel about and express their Japanese heritages. So today, to begin, the project principal investigator, Dr. Curtis Takada Lux, and the senior research associate. Dr. Rinji Sasaki Kogasaka will present the research findings in English with simultaneous translation. Followed by a short Q&A, we will have a small discussion in 11 breakout rooms with facilitator. In addition, we will provide informal and optional networking opportunities among our participants after the program. So now we will start the first part of our program, the presentation with the finding of the research project by Dr. Lux and Dr. Kogasaka. And Dr. Lux is the program coordinator of Asian Pacific American Studies and the assistant professor at the Loyola Merriman. I think the video is lady there, but I might. <laughs> and 
also the, you know, he's also the cultural anthropologist by training and degree. He teaches Asian American studies with research in multiracial and ethnic identity, as well as applied community-based research in Black, Indigenous, and people of color, com color community, wellness, and health. And Dr. Kogasaka is the assistant director of study abroad at the Pomona College. She received her PhD in international education from New York University and specialized in cross-cultural exchange and training, international migration, the Japanese community in Latin America and the Latin America community in Japan. Um, so before uh, the, I think the joy is ready for the Discover Nikkei video, but maybe I can show it at the end. And so maybe we can just start the program. So now I would like to welcome both Dr. Lukes and Dr. Kokasaka. I hope you enjoy the program today. Thank you. First, I wanna say hello to everyone. And it's exciting to see this many faces from this many countries together. Um, let me share the screen with you. We're gonna uh, be able to do this. Okay. So, um, Again, um, my name is Curtis Takara Rooks, and uh, it has certainly been a pleasure for me to uh, be a leader of an incredible team of researchers and community servants from around the globe, and many of whom you'll meet today as facilitators. We're excited about today's workshop, as you, the attendees, represent the globe, our, our global Nikkei community. Um, as mentioned before, there are 20 uh, participants from 21 countries, and so in that way, you truly embody the Global Nikkei Research Project. To begin, I'd like to extend our appreciation to the Nippon Foundation, led by Program Director Ikubo, Ikuko Okubo, who proposed this research project. The foundation not only funded the project, but in partnering with the Japanese American National Museum, provided pr the project incredible technical, logistical, and moral support. In particular, I'd like to mention Rick Nogichi, the Chief Operating Officer and the Discover Nikkei staff. So today we have two primary goals for this workshop. First, we'll briefly share with you the key findings and takeaways from the project. But for those of you who want more complete and detailed responses, please read either the executive report um, or the full report found on the Nippon Foundation website. And I believe someone's gonna drop that into the chat right now. Second, we'd like to do a bit of global Nikkei community building through our small group discussions, allowing us to have conversation as we learn from each other the meaning of our Japanese ancestry to ourselves and within our communities, exploring what does it mean to be Nikkei in 2021. The research team, uh, certainly um, the, the core research team or what I call the squad is uh, comprised of I Ikuko, Okubo, Lindsay, Sas Sasaki, Kogasaka, um, Yoko Nishimura, and Vicky Murakami Tsuda. Um, we've seen some of the, the, the field research associates who conducted our, our um, focus groups around the globe were uh, Inez Malari, Javier Garcia Wong, Kit, Sharon Yamato, Cyrus Tamashiro, Cecilia Sakurai, Sakurai, I'm sorry, um, Shigeru Kojima. Linda uh, Kawamoto Reed, Christine Piper, Ikuyo Miyamura, Mirei, Mirei Wos Takahashi, and Sebastian Kaka, Kakazu. And not research, not in this picture are um, Dr. Roberto Canicio, who is our statistician, and our intern, Sam Johnston. So we're going to provide everyone with a brief overview of the research project. We conceived of the project in the summer of 2018, beginning with feasibility and brainstorming sessions. Planning and development meetings then extended through the fall, and we launched the project in December 2018. Okay. Primary data collection, um, uh, primary data collection continue then from January through the summer of 2019. The completion of the technical report for the Nippon Foundation completed the project in the summer of 2020. Okay. 
So the, the project employed a mixed method, ethnographic research methodology, um, using both quantitative data and qualitative data approaches, along with archival data from existing academic sources, which were pri primarily historical and demographic. So let's go here. As illustrated in this slide, um, the, the project employed a mixed method ethnographic research methodology using both qualitative, uh, as I said before, qualitative and, and quali quantitative approaches. Um, as you see, uh, the first wave um, was a pilot survey administered in in early January 19, which has allowed us to confirm the feasibility of the online platform for the survey and to and adapt it to various electronic devices. The pilot sample consisted mainly of US-based Nikkei as we recruited through various organizational networks, predominantly the Nikkei College and University Student Union, along with other Japanese American youth and young adult leadership programs. We then, in January 27th, um, moved on and administered the, the worldwide survey in two waves. The first, first ran from January through February and the second from March through April. The qualitative component consisted primarily of focus groups conducted by the field research associates during the summer of 2019. Using focus groups, we sought to confirm the preliminary findings of the quantitative data, as well as gain greater insight to how it was that young adults of Japanese ancestry conceived of themselves as Nikkei. What does it mean to them? How, how, how did they live their lives as Nikkei? We recruited field research associates worldwide and brought them to Los Angeles in the spring of 2019 for a training. For me and the squad, it provided us insight not only into how the FR, the, the uh, field research associates conceived their lives as Nikkei, but also into their larger Nikkei communities that they were a part of. This included ethnic community infrastructure, for example, cultural centers and organizations, religious communities, both Buddhist and Christian, and general community celebrations. Perhaps the biggest takeaway was that for that weekend, we began to form our own little community of curious Nikkei. Now, over the next several slides, um, we'll sh we will um, share with you several of the um, findings that we had. Uh, that are the study sample demographics and what we felt were the key findings, along with an overview of the data that we collected. After working with the data, we summarized what we learned into three key findings or takeaways. First, that Nikkei young adults continue to have a strong sense of a Nikkei identity. Second, that Nikkei young adults are interested in developing and expanding their global Nikkei networks. And third, Nikkei young adults are interested in strengthening their ties to Japan. Now, what we found in many ways was not new or unknown to those of you living in your communities. Often ethnographic research is less about discovery Rather, it allows for empirically based description incorporating depth beyond the broad based uh, survey or demographic data that sort of describes our different communities. So here's what we're going to sort of share with you um, in the next several slides. One is a sort of the, the study respondent demographic summary. What is, and, and along with several other uh, other findings that we were able to take a look at. So let me start with the basics. Here we see the basic demographics of the survey sample. As you can see, the survey generated a total of collected responses of about 6,300. We were able to sort of pull that together to a base sample of about 3,800 so that of, of surveys that were completed enough that gave us enough responses so that we can then do different work with it. Um, and we derived that base sample from a cross tab, uh, cross tabulation of age and generation. In order for us to um, do our analysis for purpose analysis, we organized the responses into four global regions. The largest portion of the responses, 46%, came from 
uh, South America. Australia contributed about 2%, Asia about 8%, and North America was second largest with 41%. Within the sort of Asia, uh, Australia region, also include New Zealand, uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and in Asia, we sort of lumped together Asia, I believe um, Europe was for, for, we did some separate analysis for Europe, but we sort of then combined them with some others because the sample was a little bit small. Um, but in Asia, we included Japan and the Philippines and other countries there in Asia, so. Um, you can also see in this slide too, um, sort of the, the survey languages um, that we used in, th in four languages and the proportion from, uh, from all of those. Originally for this workshop, I'd wanted to pull out several individual countries for analysis, in particular the Philippines, Brazil, and Argentina. But due to some unexpected circumstances, our family circumstances, I was unable to do it. So I wanna offer my apologies and hope we can do a, a more country-based analysis in the not too distant future. Um, finally, we organized um, our slides into uh, um, generational and we'll sort of get to those in a moment. Um, but first I'll take a look at sort of age and gender and age distribution. Um, of course, we targeted young adults um, in the study. And as you can see that on the right side of, of the screen, that 18 to 20 year olds uh, to 35 year olds um, were the were sort of the largest portion of our sample of about 67 percent of the sample. Uh, the next group was 35 to 50, represented 16 percent. Uh, the 50 to 65, uh, 9 percent, and the over 65, 6 percent. By gender, we took a look at it. it was it sort of um, it skewed heavily female um, with 62% of the respondents. Males made up 36% and other gender, gender identifications about 2%. When we looked at uh, region, our sort of generation, we can see that, um, we can see, see some things that sort of reflect both sort of current and sort of historical tr trends. Um, most of the generation that were part of uh, the survey were um, again, sort of third generation, fourth generation, fifth generation, um, and then sixth generation. Um, the, the generation as you see in this slide, we had were Issei, or it's called Shinisei or New Issei, uh, Nisei, Shinisei, Sansei, Yonsei, Go say and Rok say. During our analysis, we sort of collapse um, the, the generations based on sort of both generation and age. So that we were able to take a look at um, uh, uh, some generational analysis that looked at both Sansei, Yonsei, Gosei, and Rok say were all sort of the young adults and some of the Shinise as well. Um, Issei and Nisei tended to be a little bit older. But you can also see in this slide how they're distributed by um, region. Uh, not surprisingly, South and North America reported the third large, the largest third generation or greater number of respondents. Each of the regions have large Nikkei communities, both originating and sustaining since about the mid to late 19th century. So it's not surprising that we have sort of uh, later generations. Um, as you can see um, by the, for North America is in red and uh, Latin America is in um, blue. Okay. Right now I'd like to turn some things over to Lindsay who will provide some insight into the qualitative work that we did. Great, thank you so much, Curtis. Um, it's really nice to see so many people here today. Um, I'm gonna talk about some findings about what it means to be Nikkei. So for the purpose of this research, the definition of Nikkei used was Japanese immigrants and their descendants throughout the world. As one can imagine, the concept and notion of the term Nikkei is quite complex and fluid. 
Data demonstrated that Japanese heritage and Japanese values are two main components that strengthen and comprise a Nikkei identity. The term Nikkei was most prominent in South America. For example, a young adult from Brazil commented, to be Nikkei is to understand and practice Japanese principles while adapting to the values of the country of origin. Nikkei is the person who can find the balance between those two worlds. So while many young adults of Japanese descent strongly identified with their Japanese roots or ancestry, they actually did not necessarily use the term Nikkei as part of their identity. So again, for example, in more recently established Japanese communities like in Australia, the term was seen and thought of actually as an American term from the US, while people of Japanese descent in the Netherlands use the term hafu, and those in the United Kingdom acknowledge that there is actually no concept of the term Nikkei. Whilst in North America, Canadians of Japanese descent stated that they see themselves as Japanese Canadians and do not identify with the term Nikkei. Similarly, young adults in the United States use the term Japanese American much more than the term Nikkei. But for both, being Nikkei can represent a political identity in the form of activism and awareness. So a Japanese Canadian commented, I became immensely proud after learning about my grandparents' lives during the internment. I work every day to unlearn their shame and to proudly embrace my Japanese identity as my grandparents' and parents' generation felt that they could not. It becomes a bigger part of my identity every passing day. Another example is a Japanese American young adult stated that it was a sense of responsibility to learn about their family's history and how the internment experience greatly shaped a lot of values, morals, and beliefs for later generations. So throughout the focus groups and analysis of the survey data, respondents formed their Nikkei identity through family, local, and transnational connections. Communities around the world expressed being Nikkei was much more than just a connection by blood. Being Nikkei not only is an individual expression, but a shared sense of belonging community, experience, meaning, and cultural memory. Japanese values were clearly important to global Nikkei young adults as they consistently identified a set of traditional values and how they see themselves in relation to the world around them. One of the most common themes around the world was pride and not only having Japanese values that are learned from family and community through cultural activities, but also sharing these values with the broader local society and to future generations. Many respondents across the diaspora took great pride in being Nikkei because one can represent two cultures simultaneously. So for example, a Nikkei in Colombia stated, I always try to make the best of both cultures in all aspects of life, cultural, education, work, and personal. And lastly, a Nikkei in Argentina commented, I have pride being Nikkei since I can show and tell what little I learned from my grandparents and follow the customs that we have from generation to generation. And so on the next slide, as previously as mentioned, one of the significant markers that comprise the Nikkei identity is the retention of Japanese values. Several participants were asked to rank 12 values in the order that they believed shaped their identity. So 82% of the young adults selected Gambaru, or to do your best, and as the most important value, which was common actually across all groups and regions, age groups and regions. Sonke, or respect, came in second at 78%, which was then followed by kansha, or gratitude, at 69%. Nikkei respondents, particularly in Peru and Argentina, 
especially noted that they felt a huge responsibility to uphold Japanese values, such as respect and honesty in the workplace and society at large. A Nikkei Peruvian, for example, commented, being Nikkei for me is being a person with a great responsibility because we are the face of Japan in other countries. It is a, being a person with two identities. In addition, the Nikkei young adults in the Philippines specifically expressed how grateful they are to be of Japanese descent. Several voiced that it is a great privilege to be Nikkei, to be of Japanese ancestry is an honor and a pleasure for me, and I feel much respect for them. It is a gift. And interestingly, Motai and I, or Not to Waste, was fourth among the young adults with 68%, unlike other age groups that ranked it around the seventh highest on average. And this may be because it intersects with this age group's interests on sustainability and environmental justice issues. And now I'm going to pass it back to Curtis to talk about cultural components. Thank you. So cultural retention is a difficult and sometimes contested sort of academic notion because culture is not static and it's constantly changing, both in the country of origin, in this case, Japan, and in the destination countries, for example. For example, Obon and Bon Odori are actively practiced by community members in South and North America, while in Japan, the larger community celebrations are less widespread. Another example is Oshogatsu, our New Year's celebrations. While there is indeed a continuity of Japanese cultural and family traditions, those blend with the traditions of the host countries and intercultural families, creating modified and new traditions along with new and shared meanings. I'll use my own family as a personal example. For New Year's, we both combined uh, soba, the eating of soba for good luck and eating of black eyed peas for, for, for good luck. So in, in a sense, we've combined the true, true, two traditions together in, our, our, in a significant or New Year's meal. What is important for this study of global Nikkei is that Osogatsu has a significant meaning for Nikkei around the world. The slides example several of the cultural measures employed by the project. Jap we found that Japanese language remains salient even if Japanese skills have diminished over generations. Eating Japanese food and the knowledge of food preparation remain extremely solid, if not strong. And we found correlates among the speaking of Japanese, even just a few words or phrases the eating of Japanese food and household fusion food, Japanese and household, uh, Japanese fusion foods and ethnic community sort of engagement. So if someone spoke Japanese, if even a few words, ate Japanese food with some regularity, um, they tended to be highly involved in their ethnic Japanese or Nikkei ethnic community. As the slide shows you, um, you can see sort of, uh, the, the continuity of those various things and the, the sort of uh, of the language of, of the light. So I won't go over all the sort of pieces on the slide. You can see those. What I think is particularly interesting here is the sort of contemporary pop culture um, and the anime and manga being um, a sort of celebrated among them. The, the last thing we looked at was this notion of connectedness. Well, in many respects, difficult to measure, Connect connectedness is difficult to measure. To get at this, we use a 10 point Likert scale, asking people to respond to statements of importance about a series of topics and issues. So here we sum sum sam summarize a sampling of those. When asked about connectedness, the connectedness the respondents felt to their individual Nikkei identity, 74% reported a Likert skill response of seven or greater, indicating a strong connection. You will note that the regional, note the regional differences. Some we surmise of this regional difference we surmise are based in the longevity and strength of a local Nikkei community infrastructure. That is, they have organizations, they have buildings, they have specific places um, and gathering places. 
as well as individual and family experiences are part of it. Without going over each variable outcome on this side, I invite you to study it for a bit. Finally, an important key finding was that 90% of the respondents reported strong interest in being connected to a global Nikkei community of some sort. We found this to be absolutely amazing. We're pretty excited about that particular finding. Again, I want to thank you for coming, being a part of this Discover Nikkei workshop, and we hope that this could be one step in the process of developing a larger global Nikkei community. And with that, we open it up to um, questions and observations about sort of the findings of the, the young, young adult research project. So if you can answer, you can put questions in the text and we will sort of respond to sort of, sort of those as they come in. Okay, we have one question that says, I grew up in Brazil and I live in France. How was my data accounted for? In, in this particular, at least on the survey part of it, um, it would depend on sort of uh, where your survey came in from. If it came in from France, we would have counted you with uh, Europe. And then Europe was again collapsed with Asia because of some numbers, um, I believe. Um, but in this, if you were in a focus group, then it would have been wherever the focus group was in Asia. So there's a lot that we don't know um, because we weren't able to have uh, do as many focus groups in as many countries as we want, although we, we were able to do uh, 11 countries. Um, but we certainly would love to learn more about your life experience there in France. Someone just asked if we will be comparing our data to other immigrant groups. Probably not. Um, uh, it's difficult to compare data that's collected for di two different studies, uh, unless you're in talking about the most general census. Um, so, uh, so part of that will sort of makes it a little bit more difficult. Okay, someone, Shini say and Nisei, um, or Shin, so Issei represents the first generation or the generation that uh, left Japan um, and sort of traditionally, and, and in some ways it sort of gets us into other conundrums, but traditionally World War II is one of the markers uh, of sort of the outward migration from Japan. And so those people sort of migrating before uh, the World War II um, or the Pacific War are considered sort of Issei or old Issei. Shin, which actually literally means new, or the new first generation are those in the post-war period. Um, Nisei refers to the second generation leaving Japan or the first generation born in the, in the uh, country of origin. Um, Lindsay, you wanna take a couple of these? Um, sure. Um, there's one that said, um, it's amazing that the U.S. doesn't identify Nikkei as a definition. Why is that? Yeah, so in terms of the, the, the data and the um, answers and responses from the focus group and on the survey, it's that um, the Japanese American um, community um, has not traditionally used the actual term Nikkei to identify themselves um, individually using that term. It's generally done by um, the hyphenated identity um, just based on certain um, cultural aspects, right, of the U.S. Um, that's a hyphenated Japanese American and or by generation. So if someone asks, oh, are you J or Japanese American, then you say, oh, I'm, I'm also fourth generation, et cetera. So the definition and the term is not necessarily used, but the essence of what a Nikkei is, is embodied through cultural heritage and ancestry. So one of the things we are talking about some of the younger, uh, the sort of 18 to 25 uh, year olds, is that in, in, in the US, that they're actually cultivating the notion of being Nikkei. Um, and part of that is because 
within that age bracket, they have some people who are uh, sort of second generation or say they have others who are fourth, sixth generation, others fourth, they're mixed, mixed race, all these sort of different combinations. And so they've really been working to find a, a sort of a term or, or a Nikkei is the term that they're using so that their differences aren't so much um, uh, focused on and, they, and so it, it really like what they shared and it's also the young folks have this have um, ways of shifting in and out of different identities they can they, they can see them as their self as Jonesay and Nikkei at the same time without conflict well when we looked at the study about just over 50 percent of the young uh, young DK were actually of, of mixed origin. They were sort of, uh, they were mixed race. Um, and so uh, much of what you're seeing, given that they were just about 52% of the, the sample, um, sort of reflects the, the multiracial thinking. We didn't pull them out specifically and sort of just grind theirs at this point. Um, this first report was uh, looking at this overall. Some of the work that we would like to do as, as we move on is to sort of then parse out by country, parse out perhaps by multiracial and do some more work with that. So um, that, that, uh, that work is, is still to come. And just as a follow-up to that, um, even though so many of the um, respondents in the sample were um, multiracial, um, they really actually, and this was across uh, regions, um, really did uh, actually strongly identify with um, their, their Japanese ancestry. So it's really interesting to see how they navigated in their respective spaces and respective countries, um, the strength of their, their Japanese identity or their curiosity, because even though um, they might not necessarily speak the language, they had the curiosity and desire to further and want to know um, more about their Japanese ancestry culturally. But also what was interesting was those Japanese values really came out so strong as part of um, the Japanese side to maintain for future generations. Someone asked if the Nikkei values were prior, uh, prioritized as values based people in Japan. Um, what are significant differences? We didn't do so much um, uh, work with sort of young people in Japan and sort of the attitudes and sort of what they saw are, are, are prime values. Um, we were really focusing on those in the sort of a global network. Um, the archival research will tell us that uh, many of those same values are, are, are still held by the young people in Japan. But um, again, we didn't dig real deep in that and sort of what that means to them um, because that wasn't the target population we were interested in. So one of the questions that uh, there are two two questions that I, I sort of want to take on sort of um, are there some groups such as Ainu or Okinawan who might reject the notion of Nikkei um, that that sort of could well be um, uh, true. So we what one of the things that I will say is that within the sample because of the way in which it was we, it was pushed out both on the um, uh, uh, through the internet um, and Facebook and other sort of social media. Um, my sense is that the sample that we looked at and what we were tasked with doing by the foundation, um, for those people for whom Nikkei are having that sense of connection to their Japanese ancestry was, a, was a, important to them, um, or they were the ones who sort of answered the, the, the survey. And so we, we certainly have a convenient sample issue there. So we're not attempting to, to sort of speak for all Nikkei or all people of Japanese ancestry globally. Um, but indeed, uh, knowing that it's more complicated than this. And so in some respects, this is a first go and serves as a baseline because we believe this is the first global study that was done where the sample was collected at the same time with the same instrument for the same purpose versus uh, sort of country specific uh, um, uh, studies. And so this is, this is 
truly just the beginning and I hope that uh, uh, scholars following us um, will dig deeply into this and sort of uh, sort of pull a lot of this stuff apart and in some ways you know as as uh, as a scholar I'd be happy to have all of the stuff refuted because then we have more we'd have more understanding and deeper understanding of what's going on so um, at one level, another level, I don't want to be refuted, but but you understand what I'm saying is that if we if the more information that's gained, the more that we learn, the deeper our understanding. And so this is a beginning. Um, so we didn't even have anything for us to critique because there was nothing out there. I saw there's a question about what was the most surprising aspects of the findings. You go first. Okay. Um, to be honest. Um, you know, there's not as much literature, it's starting to emerge, right, of younger generations. And for me, the most surprising aspect was the fact that young adults, even if they're in, you know, their third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation, that they truly still and maintain and have a really strong sense of identity, even though they are, um, you know, living obviously throughout the diaspora and or they are multiracial or have um, uh, different ethnicities. So for me, it really indicated or something that it was really strong, um, the desire um, and the action um, of perpetuating um, Japanese culture, even though, um, you know, they're so far they're down generation. And then also the idea that I think with young adults as well, um, obviously that we're in the uh, mode of technology and different ways of communicating, that there truly is that sense um, of connecting not only individually with their families and local communities, but having that really broad based desire to connect uh, worldwide through different means. That's so for me, it was the excitement about being able not only connect with their own communities, but connect um, globally. Um, one of the things we were able to attend was Kopani um, as part of this project and listening to some of the, the young adult uh, breakout sessions as they were really excited about um, trying to uh, think of ways that they could use technology to, to get together, whether that was sharing recipes from their grandmothers to full on music festivals and art festivals and different ways. And so that was a, the exciting part. And just sitting in that pot, sitting in that group as uh, three to four languages were being used and people were simultaneously translating for someone who didn't have the English skills or someone who didn't have Portuguese skills was having it translated into English was just, it was, it was incredibly amazing and powerful to see. 